came upon the midnight clear. 251. Take your Bibles and turn to that text that we read just a few moments ago in Exodus chapter 3. We're looking at the names of God. This is the third message in the series on the names of God. And we find eight of those, as we've seen before, listed for us in these three short verses in Exodus chapter 3. We see, I am that I am. I am, Lord, which is all capital L-O-R-D, God, capital G, little o-d, the Lord God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. But God calls his name singular, though there are eight different listed here, and there are more than 20 others that are given to us in the Old Testament alone, and then more that are given to us in the New Testament as well. And yet he refers to his name in the singular, as we've seen. This is my name, Forever, And God says that his name is a memorial unto all generations. He gave us his name, not merely some special days to remember him by, though we do remember him on special days, but he has given us his name as a memorial unto all generations. Then last week we looked at one additional passage in the Old Testament that related to the name Yahweh, or Jehovah. That's the 
name that is in all capital letters, L-O-R-D, and we saw that that name is found at the second giving of the tables of the law after Moses smashed the first tables that God himself had written with his own finger. It was in the context of the Mosaic covenant that God gave to national Israel in Exodus 34. Beginning in verse 5, And the Lord descended in the cloud and stood there with him and proclaimed the name of the Lord. God is using his name as he gives the law. And the Lord passed by before him and proclaimed, The Lord, the Lord God, merciful and gracious, long-suffering and abundant in goodness and truth, keeping mercy for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, and that will by no means clear the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children and upon the children's children under the third and fourth generation. We saw that the name of God is used here in the context of showing mercy to the thousandth generation, but to the third and fourth generations, sending his judgment of those who reject him. This manifestation of his name, a manifestation of grace to those who trust him and to their children and their children's children. And in verse 8 it says, And Moses made haste and bowed his head toward the earth and worshipped which is a declaration of the name of God requiring worship. And he said, If now I have found grace in thy sight, O Lord, let my Lord, I pray thee, go among us, for it is a stiff-necked people, and pardon our iniquity and our sin. God had just revealed his character just a few moments before, and now Moses appeals to the character of God, which he has revealed in his name. And Moses says, pardon our iniquity and our sin and take us for thine inheritance. And he, that is God, said, behold, I make a covenant. Behold, I make a covenant. God is here cutting a covenant with Moses and with the children of Israel. Before all the people I will do marvelous uh, do marvels such as have not been done in all the earth nor in any nation and all the people among which thou art shall see the work of the Lord for it is a terrible thing that I will do with thee a terrifying thing God said what I'm going to do through my covenant is I'm going to show the nations of the earth that I am Jehovah God was going to take this sinful, stiff-necked, rebellious people, which Moses has just referred to in the preceding verses, and he is going to do something that has never been done before in all the earth, nor in any nation. And all the peoples among which thou art shall see the work of Yahweh. It is a terrible thing that I will do with thee. God uses his people to manifest his name. We'll be seeing that a little bit later on. It's rather interesting, it was at the giving of the law that Jehovah made this covenant with national Israel. And it's interesting to note, both in this text and also in Deuteronomy chapter 5, that God had never given this particular covenant to any people before this. In fact, the text tells us that God never gave the Ten Commandments to anyone prior to giving them to Moses. Listen to what it says in Deuteronomy 5. And Moses called all Israel and said unto them, Hear, O Israel, the statutes and judgments which I speak in your ears this day, that ye may learn them and keep and do them. The Lord our God made a covenant with us in Horeb. That's what we've just read in Exodus 34. The Lord our God made a covenant with us in Horeb. The Lord made not this covenant with our fathers, but with us, even us, who are all of us here alive this day. The Lord talked with you face to face in the mount out of the midst of the fire. Deuteronomy 5, 1 through 4. Then you recall last week we added one additional passage in the New Testament. The words of our Lord Jesus Christ in his high priestly prayer in John chapter 17. A prayer in which he prays only for the elect. He does not pray for others. He prays only for those whom the Father has given to him. And in this passage, four times he speaks of the name of the Father. 
We noted that our salvation is based upon the name of God. The Father has given Jesus a name which is above every name. That at the name of Jesus every knee should bow of things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth and that every tongue should confess to the glory of God the Father. The name of Jesus is the name of God. Jesus is, as we've seen, Jehovah himself come in the flesh. He is the one who declared himself to be the I Am. He is the one whom the Jews accused of blasphemy because he took that name and said to them before Abraham was, I am. That's the name God gave to Moses at the burning bush in our text in Exodus chapter 3. Our Lord Jesus Christ, when he spoke that name in the Garden of Gethsemane, and he said, I am, they fell backwards. They were knocked over just by the declaration of the name, the holy, majestic name of God. Keep through thine own name those whom thou hast given me. That's Jesus' prayer for us. That's why our eternal security is there. Keep through thine own name. The name of God is at stake if he does not keep us safe. The name of God is at stake if we are not eternally secure. And God always defends his own name. I have manifested thy name unto the men which thou gavest me out of the world. Jesus himself revealed to us the Father. You remember, Philip said at one time, you know, Lord, show us the Father and it sufficeth us. Jesus said to him, Philip, have I been so long time with you, and yet hast thou not known me? He that hath seen me hath seen the Father. Jesus manifested the name, that is, the character qualities, everything that can be known about God. Jesus unveiled it to us. That's why when you find the name of God in Scripture, it is an awesome declaration of who the living God is. Then at the end of that passage, we find, While I was with them in the world, I kept them in thy name. Those that thou gavest me I have kept, and none of them is lost but the son of perdition, that the scripture might be fulfilled. And then he parallels at the last part of the text the very first thing he said about the name of God. In verse 26, I have declared unto them thy name, and will declare it that the love wherewith thou hast loved me may be in them and I in them. It's a magnificent passage. Magnificent passage. The context tells us that our joy, our protection from evil, our separation, our sanctification, our effective witness, our unity, our ultimate glorification, our spiritual maturity, our testimony before the world, our communication of the relationship between the Father and the Son and our love is based in the name and the character of God. The name of God also, and this is where we left off last week, that gives us, in summary, the central point concerning the name of God. The name of God indicates the entire nature, character, and administration of God, which he reveals to men and how he communicates to us. The name of God is also declared in multiple other ways as well. We see it declared here by our Lord Jesus Christ. We see it stated in the scripture. But God has also given other ways, as he declares to us, by which his name is revealed among the heathen. The first of those is, I think, well tied in with our conference tonight with Dr. Carter. We find that the name of God and the glory and the power of God are displayed in nature. Psalm chapter 8 is the first passage. We won't look at all the passages. There are many of them. But Psalm 8, beginning in verse 1, to the chief musician upon Gittit, which is a type of musical instrument, a psalm of David. O Lord, that's all capitals, capital Jehovah. O Lord, our Lord, 
How excellent is thy name in all the earth, who has set thy glory above the heavens. Down to verse 3, when I consider thy heavens, the work of thy fingers, the moon and the stars which thou hast ordained, what is man that thou art mindful of him, and the son of man that thou visitest him? For thou hast made him a little lower than the angels, and hast crowned him with glory and honor. And then verse 6. Here's what ties us in with our creation conference tonight. Thou madest him to have dominion over the works of thy hands. Thou hast put all things under his feet, all sheep and oxen, yea, and the beasts of the field, the fowl of the air, the fish of the sea, and whatsoever passeth through the paths of the sea. O Lord, our Lord, how excellent is thy name in all the earth. David looks at creation. David marvels at the land animals. David marvels at the fowls of the heaven. David marvels at the fish of the sea. He's reminded of the dominion mandate in Genesis chapter 2, where God put these things under man's hand and gave him responsibilities concerning them. Adam being able to name every one of the animals. Brilliant mind that God had given to him and how that has, since the fall, decayed and become depraved and wicked, as Paul explains in Romans chapter 1. We are to know the creation that God gave us so that we might know his name as the creator, so that we might understand his true magnificence and his glory as we look down through the microscope, as we look through the telescope, as we look at all that God has created and which he has entrusted to us. We have a responsibility because it is through this as one of the methods that God has given us a testimony to the world around us who rejects the name of God. We're going to talk about the heathen and the name of God in just a moment. We find again over in Psalm 19, to the chief musician, a psalm of David, the heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament showeth his handiwork. There are some magnificent creation astronomers out there who are studying the heavens and demonstrating that evolution would have been totally impossible. Instead of looking at the creature, which man does and who he worships, the heavens declare the glory of God. The firmament showeth his handiwork. Day unto day uttereth speech, and night unto night showeth knowledge. There is no speech nor language where their voice is not heard. Doesn't matter where you go in the world, doesn't matter what language those people speak. The language of the heavens, which declare the glory of God, is there. No matter where you go, they can look up and they can see something about the eternal God who created the universe. And the Apostle Paul picks that up in Romans chapter 1, and it says the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are understood, that is, those invisible things are understood by the things which are made, that's the creation so that they are without excuse. We need to draw it to their attention so that they understand that when they reject the Creator God, they are without excuse. It's interesting as you look at the two halves of that psalm, the first half, verses 1 through 6, deal with astronomy. They deal with the heavens, they deal with the stars, they deal with the sun and the moon. They're all mentioned here in this passage. But you get to the last half, and notice how David puts creation in parallel with the law of the Lord. Creation declares God's glory. Understanding creation enables us to give him his worthy praise and his glory. Parallel to that, God's law declares his glory. And he lists these things, wisdom, righteousness, purity, enlightenment, judgments, holiness, warnings, and redemption. Eight things. 
The law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The statutes of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. More to be desired are they than gold, yea, than much fine gold. Sweeter also than the honey and the honeycomb. Moreover, by them is thy servant warned, and in keeping of them there is great reward. Who can understand his errors? Cleanse thou me from secret faults. Keep back thy servant also from presumptuous sins. Let them not have dominion over me. Then shall I be upright, and I shall be innocent from the great transgression. Let the words of my mouth, the meditation of my heart, be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, my strength and my Redeemer. God has given creation so that the pagans, the heathen, will be without excuse. It is a warning shot across the bow. It is designed to wake them up, to show them there is a God, that their foolish theories are wrong. And then the word of the Lord is what brings them to faith. Dear people, are you ready to witness to someone who is a thoroughgoing evolutionist? You are surrounded by them. Do you know what to say to them? You really need to be here for the creation conference with Dr. Carter tonight and bring some unsaved friends. These nice people that are all around you have rejected God because they've been blinded by Satan's lie of evolution. The scripture speaks over and over of the creation and its import in pointing people to the true God because their own philosophies are dead wrong. You know, the people around you have been taught that the book of Genesis, in fact, they've been taught the whole Bible is a book of fairy tales. If you cannot answer their challenges, you're disobeying a command of Scripture. 1 Peter 3, verse 15 says, But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts, and be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh you a reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. That's not a suggestion. That is a command. You do yourself a disservice by not being able to answer an inquiring friend. More importantly, you do a disservice to Christ when you have no answer. When that happens, you confirm the unbeliever in his unbelief, and you provide a reason for him to harden his heart and to be hardened in his ways. When you don't have any answers, you merely confirm to him that the Bible really is a book of myths. Third, I think you endanger your family and friends that look up to you. Because someday they will be faced with this enemy. They will be put in a place of pressure cooking and very difficult social situation. Will they be ready with an answer? As the passages we've just read state, the name of God is declared in creation. The next way that the name of God is declared is God unveiling himself to and through his people. Zechariah 10, verse 10 through 12. I will bring them again also out of the land of Egypt and gather them out of Assyria. And I will bring them into the land of Gilead and Lebanon and place shall not be found for them. And he shall pass through the sea with affliction and shall smite the waves of the sea, which is a picture of the Gentile nations. And all the deeps of the river shall dry up and the pride of Assyria shall be brought down and the scepter of Egypt shall depart away. Now listen to verse 12. And I will strengthen them in the Lord and they shall walk up and down in his name, saith the Lord, Jehovah, all capitals. We are his witnesses. 
The way in which God declares his name after creation is he declares his name through his people. Now I think that even if you don't feel it's necessary to know anything about creation so that you can clear the name of God among the heathen, you must certainly know that the way we live, walking in the fear of the Lord, declares the name of God to the unbelievers. For good or for bad, God has made us his witnesses to declare his name in all the earth. The last command that our Lord Jesus Christ gave, Acts chapter 1, when they were therefore come together, he asked of him, saying, Lord, wilt thou at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? And he said unto them, It is not for you to know the times or the seasons which the Father hath put in his own power. He confirms their question to be a true question and that it will happen. But he tells them the timing is not theirs to know. But in verse 8, ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost is come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria and unto the uttermost part of the earth. And when he had spoken these things, while they beheld, he was taken up, and a cloud received him out of their sight. And you know of the two angels who stood by them in white apparel and said, Ye men of Galilee, why stand ye gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus, who is taken up from you into heaven, shall so come in like manner as ye have seen him go into heaven. Magnificent prophecy. But did you get it? What we're supposed to be doing? We're supposed to be declaring his name in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and unto the uttermost part of the earth. God declares his name both to and through his people. Second Samuel 22.50, which is quoted word for word in Psalm 18.49. Therefore I will give thanks unto thee, O Lord, among the heathen, and I will sing praises unto thy name. We are the instruments that God has chosen to declare his name among the heathen. First Chronicles 16.35 And say ye, save us, God of our salvation, and gather us together, and deliver us from the heathen, that we may give thanks to thy holy name and glory in thy praise. Save us, O Lord our God, gather us from among the heathen, to give thanks unto thy holy name, and to triumph in thy praise. God declares his name to and through his people. The third way in which we see God declaring his name and declaring his mighty presence, which is a declaration of his name, is in judgment. Psalm 75. To the chief musician, al a psalm or song of Asaph. Unto thee, O God, do we give thanks. Unto thee do we give thanks, for that thy name is near thy wondrous works. Declare. And in this psalm, he speaks to those who have rebelled against him. I'll not read the entire psalm, but we move down to verse 7. It says, But God is the judge. He putteth down one, he setteth up another. For in the hand of the Lord there is a cup, and the wine is red, it is full of mixture, and he poureth out of the same, but the dregs thereof. All the wicked of the earth shall wring them out, and shall drink them. And then at the end of that, I will declare forever, I will sing praises to the God of Jacob. All the horns of the wicked also will I cut off, but the horns of the righteous shall be exalted. Pour out thy wrath upon the heathen that have not known thee, and upon the kingdoms that have not called upon thy name. Again in Psalm 102.15, the name of God is declared in his judgment. So the heathen shall fear the name of the Lord, and all the kings of the earth thy glory. God has chosen multiple ways in which to declare and to reveal his name. But you know, there is something very important that affects us as believers. God does defend his own name so that it will not be blasphemed. I'll not read the entire chapter to you, but when you have a moment, read Isaiah 37. It is the narrative dealing with Sennacherib, and Rav Shaka, Sennacherib, the king of Assyria, who has come down and who has surrounded the city of Jerusalem, and his general, whose name is Rav Shaka, 
blasphemes the name of God, the God of heaven. He boasts about how many different countries he's conquered. He boasts about how their gods were not able to protect them and their gods were not able to deliver them. And we find that as he brings his message, he writes a note to Hezekiah. He has to run back home to take care of a little rebellion that has arisen at home. But he sends a, a scroll to Isaiah and tells him, your God is not going to be able to save you. And we find in verse 3 and following, the scribe who brings this to him, they said unto him, Thus saith Hezekiah, this day is a day of trouble and of rebuke and of blasphemy. For the children are come to birth, and there is not strength to bring forth. It may be the Lord thy God will hear the words of Ravshakah, whom the king of Assyria, his master, hath sent to reproach the living God and will reprove the words which the Lord thy God hath heard. Wherefore, lift up thy prayer for the remnant that is left. And so Hezekiah receives the message in verse 14 from the hand of the messengers. He reads it, and he goes up to the house of the Lord, and he spreads it out before the Lord, and he prayed to the Lord. And you know what he prayed? He prayed, God, we know that those other gods are no good. That's why he was able to beat them. But it's your name that's at stake. You are the God who made heaven and earth. You are the God who is stronger than any other God. You are certainly stronger than the gods of Assyria. O oh Lord, defend your own name. Let it not be blasphemed. And we find as we move to the end, Isaiah the prophet comes to him. And Isaiah says, your prayer has been heard. And here's what God has said to you. Therefore, thus saith the Lord concerning the king of Assyria, He shall not come into this city, nor shoot an arrow there, nor come before it with shields, nor cast a bank against it. By the way that he came, by the same shall he return. He shall not come into this city, saith the Lord. Now listen. For I will defend this city to save it for mine own sake and for my servant David's sake. Then the angel of the Lord went forth and smote in the camp of the Assyrians an hundred and fourscore and five thousand. That's a hundred eighty-five thousand men that God killed in one night. And when they arose early in the morning, behold, they were all dead corpses. So Sennacherib, king of Assyria, departed and went and returned and dwelt at Nineveh. And it came to pass as he was worshiping. What irony. Oh, the God of heaven fills the scriptures with the irony of the fools who are heathen. It came to pass as he was worshiping in the house of Nisroch his God, that Adram, Melech, and Sherezer his sons smote him with the sword. And they escaped into the land of Armenia, and Esarhaddon his son reigned in his stead. He was boasting that he could beat the God of heaven and his own God in his own God's temple in the home city, capital city, as he was worshiping that God could not protect him from his own two sons. They killed him right in front of that idol. And then they got away too. God defends his name. He always defends his name, even when his people profane it and refuse to give him glory in the way that they live. When we sin, when we refuse to rep represent God in his glory, his name is blasphemed among the heathen. It's not just a matter of believing the right things, folks. It's not just a matter of having squeaky clean theology. It is a matter of living out our faith so that the name of God is not blasphemed. Paul gives an extended passage, we'll not read the entire thing, but if you read Romans chapter 2, verses 12 and following, you find that there were those who claimed that they knew God, that they knew God's law. They were rejoicing in the, the law of God, in the righteousness of the law. And then in verse 23 and 24 he says, Thou that makest thy boast of the law, through breaking the law, dishonorest thou God, verse 24, for the name, get it? The name of God is blasphemed among the Gentiles through you. 
The name of God is blasphemed among the Gentiles through you. When we fail to live in the power of the Spirit of God, to the glory of God, in obedience to the Word of God, the name of God is blasphemed among the Gentiles through us. It applies in many spheres of life. We'll not go over all of them, but I'll give you a few. First Timothy 6.1 Let as many servants as are under the yoke count their own masters worthy of all honor, that the name of God and his doctrine be not blasphemed. They are not going to listen to your doctrine if you have a life of rebellion against authority. Did you get that? That the name of God and his doctrine be not blasphemed. How about Titus chapter 2? This is to ladies. To be discreet. Chaste, keepers at home, good, obedient to their own husbands, that the word of God be not blasphemed. James 2, verse 7. Do not they blaspheme that worthy name by which ye are called? Dear people, we name the name of Christ. We claim to be Christians. Let him that nameth the name of Christ depart from iniquity, says the scriptures. When you and I insist that we can do our own thing, we can live the way we want to, the name of God is blasphemed because of us. Because we are part of the way that God has chosen to declare His name. We are His people and the sheep of His pasture. We are the ones who are declared the name of the God of heaven who owns us and by whose name we are called. It is the name of Jesus, who he really is as the sovereign God, that motivates us to suffer and to move forward without fear and to be boldly bearing the witness of Christ. Oh, there is so much more that we could say, but our time is passing. I think that's a good place to stop because as we come to the Lord's table, we need to make sure that our sins are confessed. Because you see, when we don't, when we don't confess our sins and be cleansed, when we don't repent of our sins but continue in them, it is the name of God who is blasphemed. Oh yes, the unbelievers will smirk at us and scorn us, but that's not important. What is important and what is critical is that we are causing the name of God to be blasphemed among the heathen. Dear ones, as you think back over the past two months since we've held the Lord's table, is there anything in there that you have done or said, any attitude or motive that would cause the name of God to be blasphemed among the heathen? His name is a holy name. His name is a righteous name. It is a name of grace to those who confess their sins and come to the foot of the cross. It is a name of judgment for those who harden their hearts and will not. In a few moments, we're going to partake of the Lord's table. And as we do, let us come with clean hands and pure hearts. Our gracious Heavenly Father, how we thank you once again for your majestic name. How we thank you for the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow. Father, we bow before you in your presence now. We come to you humbly confessing our sins, knowing that you are faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Prepare our hearts now, Father, as we come to partake of this memorial of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen.